So the second part, um, when we're thinking here about the, the various chemicals or molecules or nutrients, if you like, that um, we have in our diet, perhaps the three main ones, carbohydrates, proteins, uh, and lipids, which remember just means fats, fats and oils. Um, these are broken down, and I'm using the arrow here to show that they have, have been changed into something else. Um, they are broken down or digested by enzymes. Carbohydrates are broken down by carbohydrates. Proteins by protease, and lipids by lipase. Okay. Uh, carbohydrates are broken down from complex carbs into simple sugars. The way you can think of that is um, something like starch is a complex carbohydrate. It's really made up of a chain of um, lots of sugars stuck together. You know, this can go on for thousands and thousands of them, and you break them down into separate sugars. If you're wondering why I'm drawing them as hexagons, there is a reason. They are sort of hexagonally shaped, I suppose, things like glucose. Uh, proteins are broken down into amino acids. For some reason, this is the one people always forget. Uh, there are about 20 different amino acids. So all the proteins in your body um, are, are made of some combination of these amino acids stuck together. It might be a few of them stuck together. It might be several thousand of them stuck together. Uh, but, but that's what they're broken down into. Once they're broken down, you can then uh, rebuild them into new proteins. Uh, lipids again a bit of a difficult one to remember it's two things fatty acids and something called glycerol okay so that's what they're all broken down into there are three food tests that you'd have to remember of these things um, the test for uh, simple sugars like glucose glucose is a good example of this a simple sugar there are different sugars um, you know the sugar you put in your tea sucrose for example um, is uh, it, 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 this test won't actually work for the, uh, that sugar. It's don't worry about why, but it just doesn't. But you know, if you can remember that this would work for something that contains glucose, the test is Benedict's solution, which is a um, a blue colour normally, and this is the one that you would have to heat. And depending on how much sugar you have in there, it either goes uh, kind of greeny colour if there's a bit. It goes maybe yellowy or orangey colour if there's a fair bit. And if you've got quite a lot of sugar, glucose in there, it goes red. Okay, so you can actually tell how much is in there. But this one must be heated. It's up to about 80 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, the test for protein is another blue one, unfortunately. Um, so it's a, a blue, pale blue liquid, this one, called Burets. Sometimes you'll see the word reagent used here, which kind of means a, a chemical that changes colour. Kind of what it means. Um, so protein is burette and it will turn a, a pale purple or lilac, if you want to be very uh, particular. Um, if there's protein present, if there's no protein present, it's still blue. Lipids um, is a bit more awkward to describe, really. It's You would use alcohol. And... If you had alcohol uh, in, in, on, a, on a food that contains lipids, it would form a white emulsion. This just means the fat would be kind of floating around in the uh, floating around in the liquid. You can also rub it on things like tracing or greaseproof paper. Um, if you think about when you get chips and you get the, 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 that paper that the chips are wrapped in, and it goes a kind of clear colour where all the the chip fats on it. Um, that's another test, I suppose, for fat. It's not a chemically test, but it does work. Um, now the only other one you can come across I suppose is there is a specific test for starch which is a type of complex sugar uh, and that's to use iodine and this one um, starts off kind of a yellowy orange colour and if there is um, a starch present it turns a bluey or black colour um, and, and that's the specific one for starch and iodine so you'd need to know what all these three things turn into and the three food tests right on to the trickier bit which is enzymes so enzymes are these biological catalysts catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of a reaction rate is a, a, a quite tricky term I suppose to get your head around rate is how often something happens per unit of time so for example how many times per second does a reaction happen um, 
and, and what a catalyst does is it increases the rate of reaction so there are more reactions every second or more reactions per minute or more reactions per hour doesn't matter what it is but that's a useful term to get into your head the rate of a reaction the catalyst increases the rate of reaction um, common errors we know that on an enzyme there is a particular area called the active site and the active site is a complementary shape to the substrate. The substrate is whatever chemical is going to sit in here and we are going to uh, you know, break down. Enzymes actually there's two types of enzymes I should say. Some enzymes break things down like in the case of digestion. We're going to split this substrate up into uh, two separate pieces. Um, but there are some enzymes that can fix things together. They're just doing the opposite job if you like. Um, so the active site is complementary to the substrate or complementary to a specific substrate. Anything with a different shape will not fit in here. This is sometimes called the lock and key theory or the lock and key model with the idea of um, a lock only fitting one particular key. And you might say, yeah, but you can get some keys that fit more. Yeah, but I know you can, but ignore it. This is just what we'd call the lock and key model of these two things fitting together. Now there's another really useful term I'm going to give you here uh, which is uh, the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. Uh, why is that useful? Well the enzyme substrate complex means the enzyme and the substrate stuck together like this so when it fits in like the key going into the lock when they're both together you'd call that the enzyme substrate complex okay why is it so useful because so many questions are a version of this if you put this enzyme in a high temperature where it denatures remember denature means that the active site changes shape not the substrate on the enzyme the active site changes shape if that changes shape the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. If you put it in a um, so high temperature, and if you put it in a pH, which is an extreme in either direction, um, strong acid, strong alkali, for example, for an enzyme that normally works at pH, say six or seven or eight, that will denature it. And if it's denatured, the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. It's a really useful term just to have in your head because instead of trying to say something like it denatures and then the substrate doesn't kind of fit into the thing and then it doesn't sort of work and nothing. If you can just remember that sentence, it tells you exactly what's happening. At high temperatures, the enzyme denatures and the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. It gives you that answer in a nice, neat way. So it's really worth um, remembering it. Do also remember that enzymes are proteins. So just like we're talking about up, up here, they're made of uh, amino acids. And if you get a question about this, and it's very common to get questions where you have graphs, for example, you know, they'll show you a graph like this and they'll say, well, what happens at the various, uh, let's say this is pH, for example, um, we'll have a rate of the reaction at the side and you get a question it says now describe the describe the graph okay if you look this word describe is literally asking you to talk about the shape of it make sure you quote to them i'm going to put some numbers on here just because four five six and one so if i was describing this in an answer i would say the rate of reaction increases from i know i've started at ph2 but yeah deal with it uh, increases from pH2 reaches a maximum rate of reaction at pH5 I, I, you know let's put some numbers on here as well just because it doesn't matter what these numbers are increases from zero by pH5 it reaches a maximum at a hundred it then begins to decrease reaching zero by about pH six and a half and then after that there is no reaction so make sure you describe every bit of the graph okay don't just say it goes up and down don't just say it reaches a maximum, it increases up to five, where it reaches a rate of reaction of 100, then it decreases down to six and a half, and then there is no reaction. So it's like I'm breaking my graph up into different bits that I'm describing. And there, I've got four bits to describe. So that's where I'll pick marks up. Quote the numbers from the graph, quote what's on the axes of the graph, and remember to describe each separate part.